Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Militants attack Chechen parliament. Afghan president orders probe into US-run secret prison. And Chavez visits Iran to boost energy ties. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. The jury at the London Central Criminal Court found the Saudi Prince Saud Abdulaziz bin Nasser Al Saud guilty of murder and grievous bodily harm in the killing of his aide, Bandar Abdulaziz. The judge of the London Central Criminal Court will announce the verdict in the case tomorrow. The prince's defense lawyer challenged some of the evidence put forward by the prosecution and tried to refute the allegations. The Russian Interfax agency quoted security sources saying that the militants who attacked Chechnya's parliament this morning were all killed by Chechen special forces. The sources said the president of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov, himself led the operation to kill the militants. The Russian news agency confirmed that the militants held an uncertain number of hostages while two attackers detonated explosives on themselves, killing four parliament employees. The attack in Chechnya happened fast and it ended fast as well. All of the attackers were killed and the parliament members held hostage were freed. The Chechen president, Ramzan Kadyrov, himself led an operation to rescue the hostages. But what exactly happened there? A suicide bomb was detonated outside the parliament when representatives were entering the building. Then the militants opened fire, killing three guards and employees. The Russian news agency said that attackers immediately held some representatives hostage while the chairman of the parliament managed to escape. Today's attack came after a series of small attacks. Even though the attack was thwarted, the conflict in the Caucasus is ongoing, especially when Moscow is always the first to hear the gunfire in this country. Ali Hashim, BBC. Ali Hashim, BBC. The spokesperson for Afghan President Hamid Karzai announced the formation of a committee to investigate secret prisons. This comes after a secret prison in the Bagram Air Base was uncovered north of the Afghan capital Kabul. An official detention facility is also located there. More details with our correspondent Samir Alawi in this report. U.S. forces completed major redevelopment and expansion plans at Bagram Prison, located at the famous Bagram Air Base, north of the Afghan capital, Kabul, in anticipation of its transfer to Afghan authorities next year. However, Afghan authorities were surprised by leaked information confirming the presence of a secret detention facility inside the base. According to observers, this implies that it will only be a partial transfer. The presence of such a prison indicates the extent of U.S. and foreign forces, violation of other people's rights, and their assault on national sovereignty and Afghan values. According to the information I've received, this is not the only secret prison. There are others in Afghanistan. In the past, the Afghan government prosecuted Americans and sentenced them to jail for establishing secret prisons. Today, it will investigate secret detention facilities that seem to have been officially run by foreign forces. The information we've received from the NATO statement and a report by a U.S. institution deny the presence of a secret prison. The task of the committee that was formed is to investigate the details of the report and the information published by the media. Commenting on this issue is premature. Alongside the military planes that land and take off near what is known as the Black Prison in Bagram Base, the most prominent secret prison to have been uncovered by a Western human rights organization, Afghan residents received the good news that an expansion of government prisons will be sufficient to dispense with the foreigners' illegal prisons. 
مسألة السجون السرية في أفغانستان تعود إلى الواجهة رسمية. The issue of secret prisons in Afghanistan is once again officially exposed, while a number of Afghans believe foreign forces have transformed their country into a large prison. Samer Alawi, Al Jazeera, Kabul. Kabul. وصل رئيس البنزويلي هوغو تشافيز في زيارة هي التاسعة له لإيران. Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez continued his ninth visit to Iran. Relevant institutions are scheduled to discuss over 200 agreements signed by the two countries. The Venezuelan President will talk with the Iranian officials about strengthening bilateral relations and international affairs. Caracas, Tehran. منطقتان بحساب المسافات. Caracas and Tehran, two cities geographically separated by thousands of miles. But politically, the distance between the two capitals is small. Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez is in Iran again. His ninth visit to Iran represents a landmark for Iranian-Venezuelan relations. He talked in detail about the relationship between the two countries. The two countries' positions on a number of international issues have helped to strengthen the relations between them. Both Iran and Venezuela oppose the policies of superpowers, such as the U.S., and they hope to achieve justice in the world. Iran and Venezuela are in a good and normal relationship. Since Ahmadinejad became Iran's president, the two countries have entered a new era of cooperation. This cooperation has opened a new path for the two countries to form a strategic alliance from 2010 to 2015. Many see this as the basis for the alliance between the South-South cooperation countries, which is built on a shared hostility for what is known as the arrogant powers and independence from their decision-making centers. The two countries are working to make the unipolar world multipolar. The outstanding relations between the two countries support such programs. Iran aspires to play an important role in it. Non-politically, Iran and Venezuela are committed to over 200 agreements. 74 of them are being carried out. The trade volume between the two countries has also increased in the last several years, from zero to more than $5 billion per year. There is an effort to develop cooperation in all fields in order to achieve political cooperation between the two countries. In terms of oil, we are working on activating a number of programs in prospecting, petrochemical projects, and trading oil. This is Chavez's ninth visit to Iran. It is safe to say that this is a record number for any president's visit to another country. Many people are talking about the relations between Tehran and Caracas. Since Chavez took office in Venezuela, the two countries' bilateral relations began from shared political stances and developed to include all other fields. As the two countries stated, the relationship between Iran and Venezuela is now strategic. From the presidential palace, Nordin Ter, Al Alam, Tehran. In an exclusive interview with Israel Television's Oded Granot, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas said he had passed along messages to Prime Minister Netanyahu indicating that he would be willing to accept a silent settlement freeze. Abbas also emphasized that the entire world is opposed to settlement construction and reaffirmed the PA's position that peace negotiations will not continue until building beyond the 1967 or so-called Green Line ceases. Making reference to Prime Minister Netanyahu's proposal to halt settlement activity if the PA recognizes Israel as a Jewish homeland, Abbas said, every day you come up with something new, enough is enough. We recognize the state of Israel, which is, as we know, a Jewish state. The Palestinian president expressed his hope that a third intifada would not occur, but issued an ominous warning that if peace talks disintegrate, it could lead to despair among Palestinians, breeding extremism that replaces moderation. 
Speaking at a Likud meeting this afternoon, Netanyahu responded to Abbas's remarks saying, I prefer holding a direct conversation with him, one that can advance an agreement. He added that the discussion on new settlement building is only an artificial obstacle. Minister of Tourism Stas Mesenjnikov today denied that any countries have declined participation at the upcoming Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Conference slated to be held in Jerusalem. This after a call by the Arab League to boycott Israel was issued to world leaders yesterday saying that attendance at the International Tourism Conference hosted by Israel in the capital this week is tantamount to recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the city. Earlier reports surfaced that Turkey, Great Britain and Spain have issued threats not to participate. Israel joined the OECD in May and according to Mesenjnikov, holding the October 21st, 22nd conference here is a sign that the organization considers Israel as a country of financial and tourism importance. The minister did acknowledge that Ankara has not confirmed its participation. High-level discussions on how to obtain clemency in the U.S. for Israeli agent Jonathan Pollard have recently been taking place in Israel. This according to Diaspora <laughs> Affairs Minister Yuli Edelstein, who told the Jerusalem Post last night that a positive move can now happen. It requires urgent steps by the Prime Minister and the President. Edelstein said, I will do everything in my power to urge them to act and to help persuade congressmen and senators in Washington if it comes to that. Pollard's American attorneys had filed a new petition for clemency on Friday asking that U.S. President Barack Obama commute Pollard's life sentence to the time he's already served. Pollard claims that Prime Minister Netanyahu has not asked President Obama for his release. But Abe Foxman, national director of the Anti-Defamation League, confirmed to IBA News Today that there have been high-level discussions between Israel and the U.S. administration. IBA's Eli Wagelanter asked Foxman why the ADL was originally against Pollard's release and whether they had changed their stance. It wasn't really accurate to say we were against his release. The issue was that the, uh, the campaign to get him released was based on the supposition that it was anti-Semitism. And our position was it was not anti-Semitism. Whatever issues wants to take with the government, whatever legal procedures, go right ahead. But don't use the issue of anti-Semitism. That's where we separated from the community. It's all a question of Weinberger's um, mindset? Uh, to this day, how do, you, how do you judge a mindset? To this day, not all the documents have been released. In fact, that's an issue in court to release all the documents. So. Uh, the issue really was if you're calling for injustice based on anti-Semitism, that we were out of that. Uh, we are, however, signed on to a letter happened in the last several years, including not too long ago, asking for clemency. So there the community stands together, and yes, it's time, it's time to move ahead. It's time to, to grant him the clemency. Because? He served time. He did his, you know, he did his time, and um, we we are a nation of uh, of justice, and we're a nation of compassion. And it's time to show compassion. Isn't it unfair to create a linkage between the release of Pollard and the peace process? I think it's wrong. I think there's an irony all about this. The more you talk about Pollard, the lesser are the chances of it happening. It's like it's almost like Shalit Lahavdal. But um, so the more you make it an issue, the more the opposition bills, the more the prices. Uh, I don't think this should be an issue uh, between the United States and Israel. We're we're friends. We're allies. You usually make a deal with concessions with your adversaries, not with your friends. I think this should be a gesture, this should be a quiet uh, discussion. I don't think it should be tied to the peace process. I think that's, that's counterproductive to our relationship and to the peace process. But if there's such a strong relationship between the United States and Israel, how come Pollard wasn't released until now? Uh, I'm not privy to the conversations. Uh, hopefully it will happen soon, and uh, I'm confident that privately there are good and serious conversations. The majority of American Jews obviously support the release of Pollard. What's your sense of Americans in general? Uh, the American public doesn't know, doesn't care. It's not an issue. Uh, and I'm not even sure that the majority of the American Jewish community does. There are people who have been on this issue. I don't think there, anybody in the American Jewish community will be opposed uh, to clemency today. But it, it's not a burning issue that people get up in the morning and say, what's going to be with Pollard? If we didn't bring it up, if the American Jewish community did not raise the issue, he would remain in prison until 2015. 
Uh, not necessarily. There, the Israeli government continuously raises the issue, and there will come a moment of time in the relationship where we'll wake up in the morning and he'll be in Israel. He claims that the Israeli government does not make it an issue and bring it up. Oh, well, you know, okay. That, he's entitled to say whatever he wants. You know for a fact we, Israel does? Yes. The Fatah movement has rejected holding its next meeting with Hamas in the Syrian capital in light of the verbal altercation between Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and Syrian President Bashar al-Assad during the last Arab summit in Sirte. This report by Amir Ahnaniya from Ramallah. Even though information was leaked over the possibility of the Israeli government's extension of the settlement freeze, the latest statements issued by Benjamin Netanyahu, in which he stated that the Palestinian Authority is using the settlement issue as an artificial obstacle to the peace process has created a storm within the Palestinian Authority. They refuted the Prime Minister's misleading reasoning on the legality of settlements. The situation will remain unchanged until the end of next month. So, between the tit-for-tat comments, the same positions keep on being repeated. The Palestinian side refuses to resume negotiations in light of the continued settlement construction, and the Israeli side is uncompromising on the possibility of freezing construction. The settlement issue does not seem to be the only obstacle facing the Palestinian leadership, as internal reconciliation is also faltering, not only due to disputes over specific issues, but also over the location of the meeting between the two movements. The issue did not go according to plan, the tense situation has returned to overshadow reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas. The first does not want the meeting scheduled for October 20th to be held in the Syrian capital of Damascus, while Hamas insists on holding it there. We think it would be more appropriate to hold the meeting somewhere else, so why does Hamas have an issue with relocating the meeting? If it is indeed an independent Palestinian decision that does not submit to anyone else and is not affected by anyone else, then it shouldn't be a concern. Fatah has allowed Hamas to choose another capital than Damascus to hold their meeting. However, the tense environment that prevails in Arab relations remains the root of the problem. It is as if the current situation is indicating that if they agree, we will agree, and if they disagree, so will we. From the city of Ramallah, Amira Hananiya, Future TV. The leader of Iran's Islamic Revolution says the enemy has failed to foment disunity in the country and to separate the Iranian nation from the Islamic establishment. دشمن در جدا کردن مردم از نظام اسلامی شکست خورده است بدون تردید سال گذشته در انتخابات چهل میلیون مردم کشور پای صندوق های رأی رفتند در واقع یک رفراندوم چهل میلیونی به نفع نظام جمهوری اسلامی و به نفع انتخابات انجام گرفت همین بود که دشمن رو از همانی کرد خواستن با فتنه اثر اون رو از بین ببرن اما این رو هم نتوانستن انجام بدن مردم در مقابل فتنه هم ایستادن حجل سید علی خامنی was addressing crowds of people in the holy city of Qom حجل خامنی also said the west sanctions on Iran seek to alienate the people from the government adding however that the sanctions have proven ineffective the leader called on all Iranians to take the issue of unity seriously. He referred to Iran's three branches of government, saying they should close ranks and unite more than ever before. 
At least three U.S. with foreign forces have been killed in southern Afghanistan. NATO says two were killed in clashes with militants, and the third trooper was killed when a bomb exploded. NATO has not released the nationalities of the soldiers or the exact locations of where they died. The latest casualties bring the U.S. led soldiers' death toll in the war torn country to 596. Meanwhile, two Swedish soldiers were wounded in a Taliban attack in the north. This is the worst year for foreign troops in Afghanistan since the U.S. led invasion in 2001. The United States and NATO have more than 150,000 troops in Afghanistan. حبيب العدلي وزير الداخلية مع الفريق أول ركن عبد الرحيم محمد وزير الدفاع السوداني. Egyptian Minister of the Interior Habib Al-Adli and Sudanese Defense Minister Major General Abdel Rahim Muhammad discussed several issues of interest to both nations. The Sudanese Defense Minister praised the efforts of the Egyptian police, who are part of the international forces deployed in the region of Darfur. Muhammad further said that the Egyptian forces have maintained a good reputation in the world due to their technical and logistic capabilities. For his part, Al-Adli said that his ministry and its agencies are willing to facilitate and pledge security support to their brothers in Sudan, which will help achieve common goals and interest between the two brotherly nations, both government and people alike. In the southern Sudanese capital of Juba, southern political parties have reached a consensus on several issues, marking the end of the South-to-South -South dialogue. The southern parties agreed to form a committee to help write a permanent constitution for southern Sudan. The committee is set to begin the process right after the referendum. The Sudan People's Liberation Movement, SPLM, said the political parties have agreed to form a post-secession interim government. They also agreed to organize a new round of legislative elections, should the South vote to break away from the North. Meanwhile, the head of the UN mission in Sudan said that the UN has not made a decision on the deployment of UN forces along the North-South border. He added that the issue is still under discussion inside the corridors of the UN. The UN confirmation comes in response to warnings issued by the Sudanese Foreign Ministry against the deployment of UN buffer troops along the north-south borders, which Khartoum says will fuel tension between the two parts of Sudan. The warnings issued by the Sudanese Foreign Ministry against the deployment of international forces along the north-south border come after a similar warning was issued by the Sudanese Army spokesman. According to a foreign ministry statement in Khartoum, the deployment of UN buffer forces will send mixed messages, which may in turn help fuel tension and spread fear between the two parts of Sudan. The UN, through its special envoy in Sudan, said that it had not yet taken any practical steps to implement the measure. The UN Security Council and the Secretary General are willing to consider additional support to address security concerns in Sudan. Having said that, no decision has been made on the deployment of additional troops. The UN has not made the necessary adjustments regarding this authorization. The call by the head of the SPLM to deploy UN buffer forces between Sudan's north and south comes amidst growing tension between the two peace partners. Many fear that the deployment may negatively affect the implementation of the two remaining peace articles, namely the southern referendum and the Bayi region. This issue is hampering the efforts of the Referendum Commission. We hope that all parties will respond positively to our concern. This will allow the Commission to carry out its delegated responsibilities. Observers fear that a new wave of political confrontations may ensue between the international community and Khartoum. After the latter rejected a proposal to create a buffer zone between Sudan's north and south, patrolled by UN forces. The deployment of international forces is once again sparking debate in Sudan, an issue that may add insult to injury, as many observers fear, especially with the ruling party continuing to ignore it. Many young people in the West utilize rap and hip-hop to express their perspective on issues that affect their generation. Rap, which relies on lyrical performance, made its way to the Arabic language nearly 10 years ago, and today it has some well-known figures. A number of them came together for a concert in London where they presented special songs inspired by the Arabic suspended odes. More details with Rida El Mawi.
This performance encompasses all the features of American hip-hop culture. However, all of these artists are Arab. Tamar Nafar is from Palestine, Samer Zaki is from Jordan, Reyes Bek is from Lebanon, and Rabah Urad is from Algeria. As for Palestinian Shadia Mansour, she is known as the first lady of Arab hip-hop. <laughs> The art of rapping was born as a way to challenge social injustice and racism in American cities. Today it is accused of having become commercial and of promoting violence. Wael Kudeh, known as Rais Bek, says that Arab rappers have causes to defend. There's Arab unity when it comes to hip-hop. This is what has facilitated our work. First off, we speak the same language, not just Arabic, but the language of hip-hop and rap. Secondly, all five of us have a cause. We're not using hip-hop to become superstars and make money. We care about the Palestinian cause. I lived in Lebanon. Israel destroyed my country many times. This concert is the product of a project organized by the London-based cultural organization Dash Arts, which aspires to introduce the people of the world through their art. For this reason, the organizers suggested that songs include verses from the old Arabic suspended odes. And I wanted it to be poetry. I wanted it to be some kind of lyrical... I wanted it to be poetry. I wanted it to be some kind of lyrical representation from the Arab world. The suspended odes represent the region's shared heritage. So I chose Ibn Tarrafa, Umr al kaus and Abir Ibn Kulsum. When they first approached me about this project, I thought they were crazy. What does this have to do with rap? Then we found out that the poets who wrote the suspended odes are just like rappers. It's as if they were writing hip-hop. They're recounting their stories, just like we do. The language barrier did not prevent the audience from interacting with the rappers, whose words are familiar rhythms to all those who love rap, regardless of where they're from. Rida El Mawi, BBC. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online, stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.